Professor of Geology here in the Department of Marine and, Marine and Ecological Sciences at Florida Gulf Coast University. I have a bachelor's degree in environmental geology from SUNY New Paltz, and I have a PhD in geology, specifically plate tectonics and geochemistry are my uh, areas of expertise uh, from the University at Albany. The earthquake on March 11th off the coast of Japan um, was a magnitude 9.0 on the Richter scale and there's only been about five or six earthquakes in recorded history um, that, that were larger. Also, many of you might remember that when the earthquake first occurred, it, they estimated its magnitude at 8.4 and then they moved it all the way up to 8.9 and now it's gone up again to 9.0. That's because the instruments we use to measure earthquake intensity what are called seismometers. They're overly sensitive for very, very small earthquakes because we have hundreds of thousands of very, very small earthquakes um, every year. And because there's so many of these earthquakes, we make the instruments that measure earthquakes overly sensitive so that they can measure the most data possible. So when we have a really large earthquake, the, the instrument spikes and it has trouble measuring a really large event because on average there's less than one earthquake every year that has a magnitude larger than eight. So this little red dot right here shows that the earthquake occurred about 80 miles off the northern coast of Japan. The northern coast of Japan, the northern part of Japan, it isn't as populous as the southern area. See, Tokyo is down here. And so there's many more people who live in southern Japan than northern Japan, but there's still a significant population that was affected by these earthquakes. And one of the reasons why the earthquake was so destructive is because of its shallow nature. You had a 9.0 earthquake that occurred really close to the Earth's surface, so most of the energy gets dissipated out into the Earth's surface. If it occurred much deeper, like say 200 kilometers below the Earth's surface, by the time it gets the energy gets to the Earth, most, most of it's been lost or dissipated as it travels through the Earth. The fault that generated the earthquake off the coast of Japan was a thrust fault. Um, and again, thrust and reverse faults are the most common faults at convergent plate tectonic settings where two plates are moving towards each other. Um, and they're also, the largest earthquakes on Earth occur along these types of, of faults. The earthquake occurred as the Pacific Plate was being subducted or taken down beneath the Eurasian Plate. Before the earthquake occurred, <clears throat> we have what's called foreshocks, and then we have aftershocks. Uh, foreshock are very s large and significant earthquakes that occur before the largest or the main shock event. These foreshock earthquakes are sort of a, a foreshadow of a much larger event that's going to occur. Because of that built-up friction between the two plates, it starts to slip as the distance the two, the, the two sides of the fault need to make up becomes greater than the friction that holds them in place. And so they just start to slip just a little bit. And so you start to have very small earthquakes. And these are a precursor to the much larger event. So here's the four shocks. There's the main shock, the 9.0 on March 11th. And then there's been hundreds and hundreds of aftershocks. And the general area of the aftershocks is, is mostly confined to northern Japan. A tsunami is kind of funny. Lots of people don't fully understand what a tsunami is. And they believe them uh, to be generated by all sorts of different ways. Sometimes people will call them tidal waves, and that's incorrect because tsunamis are not generated by tides in any way. Uh, some people like to call them seismic sea waves. Uh, seismic meaning that they're formed by seismicity, which, which means an earthquake. And that's not really correct either, because a tsunami is a large wave produced by either an underwater earthquake or a large underwater landslide. So you just have to push a lot of water, and that'll generate a really large series of waves. And there's not just one large wave. There's a series of waves. Um, it's no different than having a still body of water like a pond. And you throw a pebble into the pond. When the pebble breaks the surface of the water, you'll create a series of ripples out in all directions. And that's what a tsunami does. And the largest tsunami wave doesn't have to be the first wave. It can be the second wave. It can be the third wave. The tsunami off the coast of Japan on March 11th was roughly 10 to 12 meters tall, which is greater than 32 feet. Right? And a gallon of water weighs like maybe like five or six pounds. 
And so when you have a 32 foot wave, you have hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. So you have a, a huge amount of energy moving towards you with an enormous weight. And it can literally just knock anything over in its path. Well, the tsunami wave on the March 11th earthquake off the coast of Japan was 30 feet or greater in the Japan area near its epicenter, near its point of origin. But by the time the wave got to Hawaii, it was three or four feet tall, if not just a little bit taller. And it's because it lost huge amounts of energy as it traveled more than 3,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean. And so the, a tsunami wave of a significant height that would impact the state of Florida it wouldn't go across the entire state. It would lose most of its energy as it traveled from uh, across the surface of the Earth. But it would surge in for a great distance, several miles. But, but that's no different than, than any other place.